Good morning. Welcome to session two of the 2020 Autism Hope Summit. This hour's presentation is titled Understanding Women and Girls on the Autism Spectrum and is presented by Dr. Erica Rao, a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm going to introduce Erica and then turn it over to her for the presentation. Erica Rao earned her PhD in school psychology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She also completed a clinical psychology internship at the Marcus Autism Center in Atlanta and a postdoctoral fellowship with UVA's STAR Autism Initiative. As a licensed clinical psychologist, Erica has extensive experience with interdisciplinary autism assessments, parent training, and interventions for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. She is also interested in gender differences in autism and improving assessment and intervention services for females with autism. I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Erica now. All right, thank you so much, Jenny. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for your patience. So we are talking about um, understanding women and girls on the autism spectrum. And I wanna emphasize that I really think of this as maybe towards an understanding of this topic because this is something that really is getting a lot of focus in the autism literature and research right now, um, rightfully so, and something that clinicians, parents, community members, all of us are trying to better understand what autism might look like in individuals who identify as female um, and how we can better support those individuals. So what we're gonna talk about today, um, is gonna start with the diagnostic challenges that we might face when we think about females with autism. I'm gonna to touch on um, gender differences across the lifespan, this idea of camouflaging, and then move into how do we support our females with autism. And hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes for questions um, at the end. So some of the big questions that we think about when we are thinking about this topic of females and ASD is, you know, there's a lot of talk about whether autism may present differently in females, whether females may be able to mask symptoms, meaning mimic their peers, um, to fit in socially. Are we as professionals less likely to actually give the ASD diagnosis, even if symptoms seem to be apparent at the same level that they are for males? And, and that critically leads to how do we support this population? Um, so knowing that the ratio of diagnosis in males to females has been four to one with significantly more males diagnosed than females, we ask ourselves the question, why? Um, and we know that females who are diagnosed after age five are more likely to be diagnosed later. So some studies have actually shown that this is more on the order of three years later as opposed to one year later. Um, and that it's important to note that in the kids who are diagnosed early under age five, that it does seem to be more comparatively even between girls and boys, but it's these individuals who maybe have more subtle symptoms of autism who are getting diagnosed later when they tend to be, um, when they are female. And so we know that this is particularly true for girls who do not have co-occurring intellectual disability or um, disruptive behaviors that call attention to their difficulties even when the core autism symptomatology, the social problems might look the same. So I wanted to touch briefly on this idea of the female protective effect because it's something that you hear about, but I wanna emphasize that this is something that is very much a hypothesis at this time. So this idea um, centers on the hypothesis that females may be somehow genetically protected from exhibiting the symptoms of autism. And there is some support for this in that when genetic testing is done with females with autism, um, the genetic findings are more likely to reflect that the females might have some identifiable genetic mutation, whereas males may be less likely to even when their symptoms are similar. So it suggests that this idea of genetic hit um, greater genetic change is needed in the females in order for them to present with the same level of social difficulties and unusual behaviors that we might think of in autism. 
But there's a number of other things that have been investigated that don't really support this. So we would think if there's this genetic correlation, this need for more genetic change in females, that then maybe there would also be more individuals in that person's family that have autism. And that's not necessarily true for our females with autism. Um, and then we think we know androgens are um, a hormone that is more present in males. So there's been males. So there's been some research into whether male, um, lower levels of androgens are in fact protective. So even within females and males, there's differing levels of androgens that people have. But um, in fetal development studies, there really hasn't been any indicator that lower androgens provides any protective effect. And then the last area is um, the idea that possibly the X chromosome that girls inherit from their fathers when males inherit the Y, maybe there is some protective gene on the X chromosome, the paternal one, but there's really no evidence for this either. So something to keep in mind and something that I'm certain more research will be continuing to focus on. So I wanna talk a little bit historically about what we have thought of as a profile of females with autism up until kind of this increasing focus on the possibility that we're missing females with autism. And so for a long time, it seemed like the females who did get diagnoses of autism had greater cognitive impairment, greater language impairment, more social problems and adaptive self-care problems, more behavioral challenges, um, so just more impacted. And they did interestingly tend to have lower levels of the restricted interests that we think of in autism. So those narrow interests. But we all know, I think that this idea of what females with autism look like is changing a bit. And so now there is also um, sort of a second prototypical profile that we think of some females with autism having. And that might be the female who has very high intellectual ability, high verbal abilities, um, and this, th this group tends to have greater social communication abilities than we might see in males with autism. Although one thing I'm going to talk about, and there is some question about is, does this hold true over development? Um, and then similarly to profile one, it seems that the restricted interests look a little bit different in these females as well. Um, now, this is not to say that you know, we know that autism is a spectrum, so there is certainly everything between these two profiles, but this sort of demonst demonstrates a shift in thinking and recognition that maybe there we have been missing some of these females who have a stronger skill set. Um, but we are still left with a number of diagnostic challenges. So we know that because of the four to one ratio of diagnosis, a lot of our tools that we as clinicians use to diagnose autism were developed in research that was predominantly done with males. So these tools maybe are very good at distinguishing features of autism in males, but we have work to do in terms of figuring out what diagnostic tools might be as good at detecting these things in females. And then we know that it's possible that gender differences in the way we parent our children are contributing to um, differential development of boys and girls with, with autism. So there's, there's good research to show that parents of girls, for example, are more likely to use emotions words when they talk to their young girls about situations. And so this sort of emphasis on girls being more social, girls having greater social understanding, societal expectations around these things may set girls with autism on a bit of a developmental trajectory that looks different. Um, so that's one thing to consider. And then we do know that girls with autism tend to be less recognized at school. And so when we have parents and teachers do rating scales, questionnaires to help us understand what symptoms of autism they're seeing in different settings. We see that teacher rating skills for girls are less likely to be elevated, meaning indicating symptoms of autism, than those of their parents, um, which is challenging as a clinician because we do think about wanting to see that these difficulties would manifest in different settings. And so this is a challenge we encounter. Um, we also know that girls are more likely to have 
uh, co-occurring difficulties with disruptive behavior or with you know, ADHD and hyperactive behavior. So those things that draw attention in the classroom. Girls are maybe having more internalizing problems but are sitting there quietly and are not as noticed. And then I'm gonna talk a lot about this idea of camouflaging that maybe our girls with autism are doing a better job for whatever reason of sort of masking or hiding or using compensatory strategies to um, get around some of their social difficulties. So thinking about what we do know right now about um, autism symptomatology across genders, we seem to have a good bit of evidence at this time that restricted and repetitive behaviors, so that criteria B for autism diagnosis, um, looks different in females. And I'm gonna talk about this first because the literature has been a bit more clear, although definitely more work is still needed. So we know that when we think about sensory interests, so those things in autism where children or individuals might be more likely to be interested in textures or certain um, aspects of how things feel or sound or look or um, sensitivities to things like sounds or particular food textures, these sorts of things, these seem to be similar across sexes. Um, but there are mixed findings on overall frequency of repetitive behaviors and the so-called severity of those behaviors with some studies suggesting that girls may overall engage in less repetitive behaviors. So there's some evidence, for example, that they're doing less lining up of toys early on. Um, and then a, a main thing that has emerged in several studies is that girls restricted interests. So the interest that we think of as being more narrow and intense um, than we might expect in typically developing individuals are, are more likely to be socially related and age appropriate than what we might see in boys with autism. So sometimes boys with autism might have a restricted interest in something very unusual like fans or washing machines or those interests tend to be more object related in general, computers or screens or mechanical things. Girls' interests seem to be more socially directed. So animals, fashion, you can see how at a certain age, these things might seem quite typical. And so it's really to what extent are these interests more pervasive, more intense, more all encompassing than we would expect. Um, and that's sort of what we're thinking about for this, for this group in this area. So then knowing that there are some behavioral differences in terms of the things we think about in autism, a, a core feature of autism is really the social differences that we see. And so the big question mark is, are, are females with autism presenting differently in terms of social capabilities and um, than males. And so there have been a number of studies at this point that have looked at this, this topic. And I do want to emphasize that there are multiple studies that show similarities, more similarities in social difficulties than differences. So that's to say not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Knowing what we know about autism is still relevant here with the caveat that much of this research is done with, done with male populations. Um, and so we wanna keep that in mind. And we know that this is more true for those little kids, again, the ones who have apparent enough symptoms when they're pretty young and diagnosed prior to preschool or in preschool. So, what does this look like over time, the social presentation? Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about now for a bit. So I think this is a fascinating study done by Mandy and colleagues in 2018, um, showing the trajectory of social symptoms of autism over the course of development between elementary school into adolescence. And what you can see on the graph here is that uh, when children are younger, around age seven, the boys' social symptoms of autism are su substantially higher than the girls' symptoms. But by the time the girls and boys reach adolescence, the girls have basically caught up in terms of 
social difficulties. Um, in fact, that curve is quite steep. So something is happening for these females at this time that is really exacerbating social problems. And so this is something that everybody's sort of thinking about how we can support females at this time when we know or prevent this from happening. Um, but interestingly, of those who had, they sort of quantified severe symptoms, so the most social challenges, 37% didn't show actually that level of difficulty until they were adolescents. So the point here is that this is happening across boys and girls. There are some individuals of both sexes who have more difficulty once they enter adolescence, which makes sense given what we know about the social demands of adolescence. So thinking about school age and what could be contributing to the difference that we see in this study where girls at this time are showing fewer social difficulties potentially. And this is an interesting study where they compared um, how boys and girls with autism and boys and girls who are typically developing attended to one of two things that was presented on a computer screen, either a face or an object, and they used eye tracking to measure this sort of attention to objects. And interestingly, there was an effect across all individuals in the study such that just girls with autism or typically developing tended to look at the faces more than the boys. And the girls with autism did look to, at the faces similarly, um, so about the same amount as their typically developing peers. Boys um, with autism did not prioritize attention to the faces as much. So this sort of lends support to this idea that maybe there is some protective effect for females such that they are a bit more socially motivated to attend to people as opposed to objects during this time. Obviously, the effects of socialization could be playing a role as well. So then the other question about this time period is this idea of, of camouflaging. Is you know, the ability to mimic what others are doing around you socially or to use strategies to get around what you know are your social difficulties, is this camouflaging something that contributes to females being better able to go on unrecognized or de demonstrate fewer social difficulties. And so when we look at the literature about camouflaging in particular, um, we see that people are sort of discussing this in two, two buckets, one being compensatory strategies. So these are sort of the active strategies of camouflaging. So um, coming up with ways to get around identified social difficulties. So this might be, for example, using social scripts. So knowing the exact steps that are involved in um, joining a conversation, for example, and following that script very closely to um, appear to be socially capable in enacting this. And then the other area is this idea of masking or mimicking, which is thought of as more passive, um, but it's more of looking around in the environment, maybe mimicking facial expressions, mimicking gestures. And there is some literature to suggest that um, girls with autism in particular are better able to use gestures, whether that's through mimicking or not. Um, and they're also better able to mimic speech patterns of typically developing females than their male counterparts with ASD might be. So you can see how that might cause some issues in an autism evaluation with a young female who is presenting as quite capable of doing these gestures and coordinating them with eye contact and using appropriate speech patterns. That could be challenging. Um, this is a really interesting study done by Dean and colleagues in 2017 where they did not use any of these uh, gold standard autism diagnostic tools that problematically have been developed mainly based on research with males. So they used an observational study paradigm to observe on the playground at school, school age boys and girls, both with autism and without. Um, and they found that out of all the 
boys and girls on the playground, the boys with ASD were the most likely to be engaged in solitary play. So to be playing alone somewhere. Um, there was a finding that just generally speaking, there are differences in how boys and girls play on the playground. So boys are more likely to do structured activities, games, girls are more likely to be doing some of these things, but also to be chatting, walking and talking, these sorts of things. They coded this as joint engagement. Um, so that back and forth social interaction between individu individuals. Um, and they found that the girls with autism were more likely to be close to their peers. So they stayed nearby, they wove in and out of activities and they had sort of this flitting behavior, moving from one thing to another. That might be hard to recognize if you're not looking closely because they appear to be with the group, but they really were not engaged in the same amount of joint engagement, the back and forth social interaction as the other girls. So you can see how this would be hard to recognize, but also is not an indicator that these girls are functioning socially as we might expect or want them to. So moving into adolescence, I'll note that a lot of the studies that have been done around adolescents and adults um, with autism have been qualitative in nature. So a lot of um, narrative perspectives, of individuals with autism, which is um, lends a really nice perspective to our understanding of what the experience might be like. So in a couple of these studies um, where females with autism and typically developing teen girls with autism or without autism were interviewed, um, they found that there are commonalities as you might expect. So typical female relationships do resolve revolve around smaller exclusive groups at this age. Um, they're foundation on, founded on self-disclosure and intimacy of relationship. And they're really more focused at this age on talking as opposed to doing any sort of specific activity, which is different from male relationships in a lot of ways. So I think it's important to highlight that um, there are many similarities in how the females with autism viewed friendship and relationships to their typically developing counterparts. So all the girls identified that friendship was important and they defined friendship the same way as trust and understanding and someone who supports you. And those friendship activities of talking and going places and going shopping and these sorts of things that girls, teen girls do were the same across these groups. Um, and unsurprisingly, Relational conflict is reported across all teen girls with or without autism. So this sort of gossipy, stab you in the back behavior um, is seen across all groups. It's a hallmark of being a girl at this time. So what was different um, across these two groups? So a main thing that emerged as different is that the teen girls with autism reported that they had fewer friendships and that these friendships were possibly more intense. Um, so a lot of time spent together with maybe one or two people um, when they were reporting having friendships. And then another key finding is that social interactions in groups has been found to be particularly difficult. So a lot of the teen girls were reporting that being in large social situations were exhausting um, and that they need lots of time to recharge after this type of thing. Um, and that it's particularly challenging to kind of parse through when you have multiple participants in a social interaction trying to parse through exactly what's going on and who's thinking what and you know what all the facial expressions mean and and how to act next um, that sort of thing is very complicated and difficult and so these are some of the quotes that um, females in these studies used and really just a sense, the, the let me be myself was really just a sense that these individuals may feel like you know, they're having to put on a face or try really hard to fit in. So what else looks different at this time? Um, 
I mentioned that relational conflict was common in all girls, but it seems like for the girls with autism, they tended to report that they were more often the victim of situations of conflict and that when conflict did arise with friends, unfortunately for these girls, they were less likely to be able to, to successfully resolve that conflict. So what they either tended to report was that um, either they took all the blame for the situation and the friendship ended for that reason or vice versa. They tended to place all the blame on the other individual and did not continue that relationship. So that resolution piece was more challenging per teen report. Um, on a positive note, these teen girls did report feeling an overall less sense of competition with their peers and their female peers, which I think is something to be mindful of. And, and also I think important to be mindful of is the fact that um, the parents who were interviewed in these studies often seem to be more distressed than their teen daughters. So I think, you know, the teen girls certainly reported that they were affected by social exclusion or social difficulties, but I think it's important to always be mindful um, of whether something is considered a problem by the individual or not. Um, and does that change our approach when we consider how to support these individuals? So an interesting, pretty recent study looked specifically at camouflaging in adolescence. So these compensatory and masking strategies and how they're used in adolescence. And previously this had been mostly looked at in adult women and men um, with autism. So this is an interesting study because when you think about um, this idea of impression management when you are a teenager, um, you know, sort of a hallmark of that time is thinking about how you are being perceived, kind of hyper awareness of what everyone is thinking about you and how you might fit in in social groups. And, and this is a time when we know that identity is forming. Um, so this study looked at not only adolescents with autism, but also at typically developing individuals with autism. And they actually found that all of the individuals were using compensatory strategies. So there was no significant difference across the girls with ASD and the um, girls in the neurotypical group in their amount of compensatory strategies used. And in fact, the neurotypical group in this study actually reported higher levels of masking behavior. So looking around to see what other people are doing and trying to copy that and, and fit in. Um, Interestingly, they did measure something that they called assimilation, which had to do with trying to change yourself um, in order to fit in. And this was higher for those with autism. So this sense that of, of being, um, not being able to be authentic was higher for these individuals with autism. And I'll talk about this later, but we do know that this in particular may contribute to mental health um, challenges in this population. But I think it's very interesting to note that adolescence in particular is a time when a lot of people are relying on compensatory strategies and looking around to see what others are doing. The question sort of remains then, are our females with autism doing this as successfully as their counterparts, um, which this study has not looked at? So moving into adulthood, um, this slide focuses kind of across all adults, males and females. So there's been several studies now showing that um, most adults with autism do use some sort of camouflaging, meaning males and females. And interestingly, a recent study um, compared that included adults who identified themselves as having social challenges but did not have autism were included as a comparison group for individuals who did have autism. And again, in this group, there was no difference in overall report of compensation strategies, meaning 
those adults with autism reported similar levels of compensating to adults without autism who say they have social problems. Um, and one thing of note is they did distinguish here shallow versus deep compensatory strategies. So shallow strategies being something like finding another, finding a place on someone's face to look to make it seem like you are making eye contact with them. Um, so a strategy for sort of getting around something that's difficult for you. And deep compensatory strategies being something like running through almost an algorithm in your head of, okay, there's this facial expression and this body language, and these are the words they're using and, and coming to, actually coming to a conclusion through a different route um, about maybe what that person's perspective or emotional state might be. So obviously that involves a significant amount of cognitive processing. And what they found was that um, both groups used both types, but the individuals with autism were more likely to use the shallow compensatory strategies, which again raises the question of how successful does this seem when they're mid interaction um, with somebody else and does it lead them to the social results that they want, which we don't know. And this is very interesting when we think about the, um, the idea that our adolescents with autism and so and, and our adults with autism may be on sort of a different trajectory in terms of how they use Camouflaging. So when you think about neurotypicals who the research suggests are doing a lot of compensating during adolescence, a lot of masking, a lot of looking around, seeing what other people think of them in order to then slowly emerge from adolescence and form their own identity. Um, and then, you know, there's the research shows that neurotypical adults who do not uh, report social challenges are then less likely to use camouflaging. So that's one pathway, but then thinking about, um, you know, the idea that in individuals with autism, the use of this compensatory strategy, these compensatory strategies may um, continue into adulthood or even increase, and, and how effective is this and how exhausting is this? So, um, specific to women, there is some research to show that women with autism do camouflage a bit more than men and that they might be more successful with it. Um, but also qualitative studies, so narrative reports from these women indicate that many times they feel exhausted by this. Um, there's concern about not being able to be how, who they want to be. So this sort of identity formation that might otherwise have happened in adolescence moving into early adulthood might become sort of problematic for somebody who feels like they still really don't fit in and aren't able to be themselves. Um, but on a positive note, the women who were interviewed in some of these studies did um, endorse hope for the future that better understanding of autism and autism in women in particular might lead to a need for less of this camouflaging or feeling inauthentic in the future as people are more accepting. So what does all of this mean in terms of implications for diagnosing women with autism? And, and is the diagnosis really necessary? I think is a question that many women who um, are maybe having some ch social challenges but are not sure what a diagnosis would bring to them, um, I think, grapple with. And so, you know, from a clinician perspective, thinking about wanting to do, do the best we can with limited information right now about what, you know, this profile might look like in females, um, we're certainly advocating the literature indicates that using multiple tools, so not relying so heavily on things like the cutoff score on a particular measure. So we often use the ADOS2 and maybe looking more closely at the, the profile that a certain person has, um, the developmental trajectory of what their behaviors and their social difficulties have looked like over time, using multiple respondents, remembering that um, we know that teachers may be less likely to see some of the more internalizing problems that girls might present with. Um, and then 
you know, there are some measures that I'm going to talk about now that are, I think, going to be increasingly useful as we gather more information. So some measures are in process to um, be used specifically for females with autism and to better understand this idea of camouflaging in individuals. So I'll talk a little bit about those. So one of these measures that's been under development for a few years now is a revision to the autism spectrum screening questionnaire that added specific questions um, for girls. So the ASSQ girl was developed and this has not been tested in a large community sample at this time. So there's no sort of cutoff score or norms. Um, so it certainly is up to the clinician to, to look at the pattern of scores and interpret them um, in a meaningful way. But they found that this did discriminate well between cases. So by cases, they mean individuals who have autism and versus individuals who don't have autism as determined on other measures of autism. Um, and usefully they included ADHD because we know from a clinician perspective that this can be challenging sometimes to distinguish the social difficulties that come along with ADHD and what is ADHD, what is autism. So they found that this measure was good at discriminating things that were more reflective of autism in females as opposed to things that were more reflective of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So this is promising, but certainly does need future study. Similarly, the girls questionnaire for autism spectrum conditions has been a recent addition to the tools that we might be able to use. Um, so this is a parent report, as is the ASSQ. Um, for girls, so there's two versions. One is for ages five through 12, one is through age, for ages 13 through 19 with slightly different items based on developmental appropriateness. And again, good preliminary evidence that it is sensitive to girls with autism and boys with autism. Um, so some of the items that were found to be kind of most specific to females or most useful were things like um, asking if the girl has an imaginary friend or is more engaged in a fantasy world than her peers. So this is something that we don't necessarily think of, for example, as historically something that we would ask about boys with autism. And But this seems to be more of a trait with females with autism to be sort of in a fantasy world, to maybe have play that is extremely elaborate and creative, which is sort of the opposite of what we think of sometimes with the pretend play with pretend play problems in autism. So an absence of creativity. Well, this may actually look more like very creative, although somewhat rigid, elaborate setups as opposed to so much of a storyline or a storyline that might be very based on Frozen or some other um, preferred TV show or something like that. Um, and also can be quite controlling when girls are um, playing with other individuals. So these are the sorts of things that are included in this questionnaire for young girls. And then recently, um, this questionnaire was also adapted to be used for adult women with ASD. And really the main change was to change a lot of the language to past tense. So things that are more relevant to childhood and school were changed to past tense wording. And again, it was found to discriminate well between women with and without autism, which is promising, but a small, small sample size. Um, and you know, the goal of this questionnaire is not necessarily something that would even be used exclusively in clinical settings. Um, a lot of these adult self-report questionnaires are available online. And so, you know speaking about women who are grappling with this idea of whether they need a medical diagnosis, this could be a way for them to sort of self-assess what maybe they have known about themselves or thought about themselves for some time. So a good addition. Um, and then interestingly, another recent addition is um, the CAT-Q, which is a questionnaire that focuses on camouflaging behaviors and again designed for adults. Um, 
So it's 25 items. It's got three areas, as you can kind of see on the left in the diagram. So they ask about pretty specific compensatory strategies. So like I mentioned, using scripts or um, intentionally changing facial expressions and body language to be a certain way. Um, and then masking strategies there in the middle on the left. So changing again, the way you appear to look more interested in others, for example. Um, and then this idea of assimilation. So um, this idea of like putting on an act to fit in or not able to be oneself, they're also evaluating this. And so another feature of this that is useful is recently it has also been used in adolescence. So um, and found to be similarly distinguishing of these sorts of behaviors in adolescents as, as in adults. Okay, so this is a bit of a summary slide of some things that the literature suggests that might reflect more of a female profile of autism, um, things to be thinking about. So, you know, we've got these domains on the left that we think of as core in autism. And so this idea that females might be more motivated and aware that social expectations are a thing, um, but a tendency to be more passive and shy. So there's some indicators that these girls, school age girls with autism might be more likely to be passive and avoid demands um, as opposed to be outright defiant or anything like that, but they may avoid these types of situations um, that girls may have better imitation skills. So I mentioned that they might have more vivid gestures. Um, they may use more facial expressions. And then I just touched on the fact that these girls might have better create creative play skills than we previously thought were associated with autism. In fact, quite elaborate setups but that this play might be more controlling or directive without that, what we call reciprocity, the back and forth of coming up with a story and equally contributing ideas and leading and following the play. Um, these girls might be more socially immature, including using a more immature voice sometimes. They might be more drawn to younger children um, but they're also more likely to have one or two or three friends and particularly in elementary school, it seems there's a pattern of maybe a peer really looking out for this young girl. But then unfortunately, as young girls enter middle school, um, the chances of being bullied seem to go up. And then at this time, we're also seeing that girls report being able to form relationships, but struggles with managing conflict, maintaining the relationships, hard time in group situations and feeling exhausted. And then recapping the RRBs, the restricted and repetitive interests. So less early lining up of objects potentially, possibly fewer overall repetitive behaviors, but restricted interests that are more intense than we would expect, but they might be focused on things like people and animals. Um, and these girls may be more likely to be sort of a perfectionist profile. So to be distressed at small changes and maybe more so than their male counterparts um, being distressed particularly by not doing things perfectly and that sort of thing. So what do we do? Um, obviously there's a goal of expanding what we know about how to diagnose these females, but there's also a goal of being able to support females with autism whether they have a diagnosis or not. Um, and so this comes down to a few main areas um, that I'm gonna touch on fairly briefly for the sake of time. So there is a lot, I will say there's a lot less research here too, specific to females on, we're sort of in this phase of trying to figure out what this female presentation looks like. There's been a lot less focus on how to support these individuals but I am gonna talk about social skills, health and life skills as areas that are really important. So when we think about social skills, um, we know that it's really important that this, these types of things be practiced in a group format, that there might be peer mentors. 
Um, and education should be explicit in things that might be awkward to talk about, but how to handle romantic relationships, what to do about dating, and early on, right? And in this new era of everything online too, focus on how to handle electronic communication, how to have get togethers over Zoom or FaceTime or what have you. These are all things that are important. Um, certainly addressing bullying and how to handle that as a social skill. And then I wanna just quickly touch on two evidence-based programs that um, have nice research preliminarily for supporting females with autism. So one is Girls' Night Out. This is out of the University of Kansas. Um, and the focus on is for adolescent girls. So they're relating to others, their ability to ha have self-care skills and their own self-determination in feeling socially competent and feeling that they have a good perception of themselves. And so it um, is centered on actually some community-based activities, hence Girls Night Out, so doing fun things. And it involves a lot of strategies that we know are evidence-based, modeling, role play, these sorts of things, the girls being involved in setting their own goals. Um, and the girls who have participated in this program did report increased feelings of social competence, um, of improved self-perception, and just an overall better quality of life. So this certainly has promise. The other program that has some nice evidence in general, as probably many people know, is the PEERS program out of UCLA. So it has a really strong evidence base for building social skills in adolescents and young adults um, with autism more broadly. And when they have looked at their results across boys and girls, they found that the, the girls did benefit from this social skills program as much as the males. Um, and we at UVA are in the process of completing a study um, of a peers group with all females participants um, with the hope that with the hope that um, an all female group might be a bit different from what usually happens in social skills groups for individuals with autism in which it's mostly males, um, few females. And you can imagine particularly for adolescents that this might be a bit less comfortable in discussing things like dating or relationships. So we're excited about that. Um, so mental health in the area of health, I wanted to just touch on this. We do know that females with autism are more likely to have co-occurring anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, and epilepsy than males. So we really want to be on the lookout for these things and support them. Um, we know these things are more likely to come on in adolescence, and you can see how that might be associated with the increasing social demands and possible challenges. And we know that um, unfortunately, teens and women do use mental health services more than males, including things like the psychiatric ER or psychiatrists in general. And I think it is important to mention that suicidality is definitely a risk that everyone should be aware of. And this is true for anybody who's having social difficulties, because when we look at sort of, this is just one psychological theory of suicide, um, but when we look at two factors here that are really contributing to thoughts about suicide, um, one is loneliness and one is a lack of social support. And we know that adults with autism are much more likely to report being lonely and that um, individuals with autism may have smaller social circles of support. So, this is something we should be very aware of, also knowing that camouflaging, specifically this concept of assimilation that we see that is higher in people with autism, um, is more associated with feeling a lack of belonging. So this sense of, I don't fit, I have to try to be someone I'm not, makes these individuals feel like they do not belong, might not have the social support. And so this is certainly a risk factor. And so knowing that specific to women, um, that the constellation of factors that are a risk factor are high intelligence, a history of any kind of self-harm, cutting behavior, like I mentioned, camouflaging, and unmet support needs, which makes sense with, you know, feeling socially supported. So 
Um, things like the social skills program, and particularly now during COVID, finding ways to increase social skills and social networks in particular and social support is really an important mitigator of this type of situation. So then in terms of healthcare access, we know that medical providers, um, while this is improving, do not necessarily get as much education on autism and particularly not on how this might present in females. So we want our girls and women with autism to be on the same schedule of health screens. The widget on the right is a resource that can help knowing what that schedule is. It's got a nice visual layout of things. Um, and then we want people to think about anxiety that happens in waiting rooms. The lights and the sensory aspects of hospitals can be uncomfortable. Um, so it may be hard to communicate with the provider. So thinking about ways to maybe prepare in advance for what you want your young woman with autism to be able to communicate could be helpful. So some suggestions here, calling ahead, maybe having the, the first appointment of the day so there are fewer people in the waiting room. Um, if you think it would be helpful, bringing in about me sort of fact sheet as a visual reference um, and anything that an individual needs to feel more calm and secure and thus able better to communicate during an appointment where they would like to speak about their health needs. Quickly, um, we know that there is a higher incidence of ASD diagnosis in individuals with anorexia. So this is something we wanna be careful about. We want to enact a structured schedule and routines for healthy habits. So here are some suggestions for these sorts of things. Structure around meals. If food is, is really a challenge, sometimes rewarding healthy choices or providing visuals with a weekly food menu um, to improve variety can be helpful. So after a certain thing has been eaten a certain number of times, it's off the list for the rest of the week. And then this Women Be Healthy is an eight-week curriculum focusing on um, health needs of women for women with autism. So it does have some nice support for um, increasing healthcare awareness and access and overall outcomes. And then the same sorts of things that we would recommend in a lot of situations, visual supports to make hygiene tasks more predictable, more, um, more accessible and increase independence in these sort of things. Um, we do know that sexual education is important. I already mentioned being explicit and direct about what the expectations are, what is an okay touch versus a not okay touch, how to say no, how to stop. Um, so these are things that, for example, the peers program for young adults does explicitly talk about sort of rules of dating, but um, even being more explicit in conversations about what are the warning signs um, that someone might be being taken advantage of or things such as this. And Autism Speaks has a nice resource there at the bottom. I did mention that parents are sometimes more likely to be stressed than their, than their teen girls, um, but maybe in general. Um, so we want to be mindful of the whole family context, right? So thinking about the person as embedded in their sort of natural environment and supporting everybody, whether this means um, respite or focus for other siblings at times. Um, we wanna be mindful of the entire context that a person is living within. And then so importantly, a strengths focused approach. So on an individual basis, does the individual prefer person first versus identity first, language. What are the strengths and weaknesses? I think we think about, you know, camouflaging in particular as something that has negative connotations in terms of being able to be inauthentic and leading to some mental health difficulties, but really approaching that from a personal level because maybe there are some aspects of camouflaging that are really working for somebody. It's not draining their energy. It makes them feel successful. Um, but maybe there are some aspects of camouflaging that are definitely not helpful. So approaching it from that lens of 
individually defining what is a strength, what is a weakness. And then of course, promoting self-efficacy. Um, so thinking about ways to increase independence and feelings of competency, knowing that challenges and adverse life events can be beneficial as a learning experience. They help us develop resilience and coping skills. So sending that message um, and surrounding, you know, our females with autism with people who believe in them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, quickly, some areas for future research. I've mentioned we need to improve continually our diagnostic measures for identifying autism. We need to have a better understanding and replication of studies that indicate that there may be differences in a female profile of autism. Um, we need to consider the appropriateness of norms and diagnostic school tools for people who identify as gender diverse as well. And we need to better understand camouflaging across the lifespan. We have some pretty preliminary information, but um, it would be interesting to understand when this process sort of begins, what is developmentally normative and um, how to sort of promote those aspects that may be useful versus those aspects that are maybe draining and, and not useful. Um, and then really a lot of work needs to be done in terms of linking what we determine to be true about female challenges with um, what, what interventions we can provide and what supports we can provide for things that individuals identify that they would like to work on and improve. Um, and I will say that there's quite a lack of um, research and intervention supports specific to females who do have co-occurring intellectual disability as the focus has sort of shifted off of these, this group right now, but certainly um, that's something to be considering and be mindful of, so. All right, well, I've used almost the entire time, but we do have a couple minutes for questions. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thanks for that great presentation, Erica. So you're right, we have time for one question. So okay. we're gonna ask the top question. It was voted um, by the most people. So the question is, how can I explain my daughter's needs to others who don't understand because her autism looks so different than what they're expecting it to look like? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think trying to, trying to talk about your daughter as a whole person and maybe trying to find um, a way to sort of quantify how much, you know, effort might be expended in terms of if your daughter is somebody who meets or sort of identifies with using these strategies or has these better, um, better social camouflaging abilities. So I think that's something that's really nice sometimes is an about me or a visual or something written down and organized and, and something that emphasizes that she's a whole person and not just a person with autism, but that she has strengths and these are her strengths and maybe these are things that line up with autism, very specific knowledge in a certain area or something. Um, and, but that there are also these very real weaknesses and Sometimes I think for everybody, we talk about visuals for people who are on the spectrum a lot, but this visual of how the things that are in the weakness column fit together with what we know about autism and, and how we know this can be linked to social difficulties and, and we know that the girls have more internalizing problems, um, I think can be, can be useful. So that's what I encourage people to do is to kind of write it down and organize it and and think about how it looks across settings and what the implications of these difficulties are for the long term too, if we don't support what will happen. Um, Great. Thank you again, Erica, for that presentation.